Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, UCL. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming along uh, to uh, our, our festival today. In fact, 
Uh, today is a day when three different festivals collide. We've had the Festival of Culture uh, going on all week. Uh, this is the start of the first It's All Academic Festival, and I'll explain that term in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, and we also have the World Archaeology uh, Festival uh, hosted here today. So whether you've worked at UCL for decades uh, or whether it's your first time here, I guarantee you that you're going to find something of interest uh, and something special to uh, keep you uh, entertained. Uh, the range of uh, activities that we've got on display today is absolutely phenomenal, so please uh, do uh, enjoy them uh, with enthusiasm. Um, I'd like to just say a few words about UCL. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Arthur, and I'm very proud to be the president uh, and provost of this uh, great university. And if I was to sum up uh, in one word what it is we are trying to achieve at this university, it would be to make a difference to the world that we live in. So we would like our graduates uh, and our scholars to impact on that world, and of course we'd like our research uh, to uh, have that uh, effect. So when we were set up nearly 200 years ago, uh, that spirit was very much a part of the ethos of this place, uh, that, that we were going to do things differently uh, here at UCL, and that spirit still very much permeates uh, exactly uh, what we do uh, in the modern world. So there are no ivory towers in this institution. We are simply uh, international in our outlook uh, and highly uh, ambitious. When I think about the history of UCL and the discoveries and inventions that have been made here, they have most definitely shaped uh, the world that we live in. So this is the university uh, that uh, conducted the first operation uh, under anaesthetic, with the university that created fingerprint analysis, um, and we uh, were involved in the first ever network connection between the UK and the USA, which essentially led eventually uh, to something we now call uh, the internet. And uh, since the Nobel Prizes were established, this university has had at least one uh, UCL prize winner every decade. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted that John O'Keefe, second along, uh, 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 is here. He won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2014 and is obviously uh, one of our speakers uh, today. Um, so today's um, panel has been charged with um, thinking about the world of the future uh, and, and relating that to today's uh, research activity. So, for example, will humans go on getting faster, stronger and more resilient? How will smart materials transform our cities uh, and societies? How will big data and the digital era transform crime and crime uh, prevention? And our answer is very simple. It will all be academic. It's all academic, uh, the basis of how we solve those problems. So we've got a brilliant panel who are going to try and convince you with their vision of the future. Uh, please make sure you quiz them well after they've uh, finished speaking. Uh, and um, I'm delighted that we have a wonderful host in Chris uh, Van Tulliken, who's a great researcher here at UCL in his own right, uh, as well as, I'm sure many of you see, have seen him, a highly engaging uh, TV presenter. So thank you again for coming to what I hope will be a fascinating debate, and I'd like to come and take their places. They're already here. So, Chris, to kick off. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Michael. Um, if you want a vision of the future, imagine a jackboot stamping on the human face forever. George Orwell really was a gloomy sod, wasn't he? Well... <laughs> Our panel, I think, may present you with a different view of the future. Um, I'm Chris Van Tullock, and I'm, as Michael said, I'm an MRC scientist funded here at UCL. I have my PhD viva on Tuesday. I'm also a doctor <laughs> at... Uh, so the, the pressure's on. Uh, I'm a doctor at UCH, um, and uh, I present programmes both for, for adult channels on the BBC and for children's BBC. And I came... I've been at UCL for almost 10 years. I came here via medical training at Oxford and then teaching at Cambridge... From where I stand, UCL is the greatest university in the greatest city on earth. 
and uh, I'd like to give it a round of applause. Um, we face, at the moment, multiple possible sources of apocalypse. Our life expectancy may be improving, or it may be about to dramatically reduce. Self-driving cars may arrive at the same moment as virtual reality. So as congestion disappears, our desire to leave our houses and enjoy it may vanish also. And there's the looming spectre of robotic replacement, both professionally and perhaps even in our more intimate relationships at home. And I so hope some of you will have the courage to ask our panel about those kind of robots, because I know I won't. <laughs> but are we getting any better at making predictions? Even as we get better at, at analysing exabytes of data from something like the Large Hadron Collider, our ability to predict binary outcomes from human decisions seems to be getting worse. I've spent most of my own life being wrong. Not about everything, but about, about lots of things. The small potatoes, the things that reasonable people can disagree about. But what about the things we're all wrong about? Those ideas that are so ingrained, so accepted, that to question them seems childlike. This presents us with, a, I think, a bit of a paradox. So if you ask smart people if they believe that in their field there are ideas that are currently universally accepted that will eventually prove to be wrong, they'll say they agree with that. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Hugh, do you believe that there are ideas in your field that will eventually prove to be wrong? Absolutely. Lots right. of them. And this, this is the... Uh, this has been the experience of every generation of human beings since human history began. But if you present those same experts with a laundry list of specific ideas and ask them to say whether or not they think they'll be wrong, they will be tempted to reject them all. So, uh, John, do you think uh, that we may eventually accept that DNA is not a double helix? I hope not. <laughs> 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 um, Zoe, what, do what's an ingredient for my heroes? So I would hate <laughs> to see them go under. Zoe, do you think uh, the periodic table might prove to be uh, totally misplaced? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, futurism is really hard. Arthur C. Clarke, one of our most celebrated futurists, appeared in 1964 on the BBC programme Horizon, a programme that I'm very fortunate to occasionally help to present. And he predicted... Um, various things about the year 2000, and he predicted some astonishing things. He said there would be instantaneous satellite-mediated global communication. He also said that astronauts would have to ser service the vacuum tubes in those satellites, so he didn't get it quite right. He also predicted there would be bioengineered dolphins acting as human servants. But he finishes, he finishes his interview by saying, if what I say now seems to you to be reasonable, I will have failed completely. The film Back to the Future, from which this panel discussion takes its name, made a number of specific predictions in 2015, including hoverboards. And I think Peter Thiel, the controversial co-founder of PayPal, summed up all our disappointment at the subsequent exploding hoverboards that did appear uh, in, in, in a statement where he said, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. In fact, he's being a bit disingenuous. He got $2.7 billion uh, from his investments in the future, so I think he showed himself to be a competent futurist. But I don't think Orwell or Clark or Thiel could hold um, even a dim light to our current panel, and I want to start by reading a paragraph from one of their biographies. My time at school was unsuccessful. I felt like an outsider, and I never got to grips with Latin and Greek. Four years of poor grades and low te test marks left me demor demoralised. Now, that might seem like an inauspicious uh, start to a biography, and it would have been so if I wasn't reading it on the Nobel Prize website. Um, <laughs> through careers in aeronautical engineering and driving a New York taxi cab, Professor John O'Keefe is one of the world's most celebrated neuroscientists. He discovered the cells that make up the brain's inner GPS, and unlike many universities and their Nobel laureates, he actually did the, the work that won him the Nobel Prize here at UCL. Um, he's a professor of cognitive neuroscience. He coined the term cognitive neuroscience, and he will be telling us about the future of the brain. It's unusual on any panel where there's a Nobel laureate for that Nobel laureate not to totally dwarf and overshadow the other people on the panel who don't have Nobel Prizes. But that is not the case here. If they gave Nobel Prizes for criminology or for the fantastically cross-disciplinary thing that Zoe Laughlin does 
they would surely, um, Kate and Zoe would surely have one each. Kate Bowers is a professor of security and crime science in UCL in the Faculty of Engineering, and she's worked in crime science for over 20 years. She's got research interests approaching crime in a scientific way. Most criminologists are, in fact, humanities graduates. She uses a scientific approach. She's um, worked for the European Commission, the US Office of the Assist Assistant Attorney General, and her work is funded by the Home Office, the US Department of Justice, UK Police Forces, and the Department of Education and Skills. She's a big wheel, and she's telling us about the future of crime. Dr Zoe Laughlin is the hardest uh, to introduce, I think, um, Zoe is the co-founder director of the Institute of Making and the Materials Library Project. She trained at Central St. Martin's School of Art and Design. She then did a doctorate in engineering at King's. She works at the interface of science, art and craft. Her work ranges from formal interactions uh, and experiments to materials consultancy and big projects with partners that you all know about, the Tate Modern, the Welcome, the Hayward Gallery. Professor Hugh Montgomery is a professor of intensive care medicine at UCL. He is the head of the UCL Centre for Human Health and Performance. I'm very lucky to count Hugh among my friends. And among my friends, he is the, um, uh, I count him as the one most likely to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, in fact, he's the only of my friends that I think is likely to win a Nobel Prize. Um, he, uh, he is, like all of our panellists, a bizarre polymath. He has experimented, he's dedicated his whole life to studying the human body. He was the first person to discover a gene related to human fitness, uh, and he's pushed his own body to the limit. He saved my life when we were on a research expedition together uh, on Choyu in the Himalayas, something he's endlessly modest about, where I was sent back with um, failure of spinal cord or uh, mental weakness. Hugh uh, summited the sixth highest mountain in the world um, with the Extreme Everest Research Group. Um, what links all of our speakers is they transcend disciplinary categorization. They are artists, musicians, scientists, and in the case of John, former taxi drivers. Um, <laughs> this should be very exciting. Exciting for me because I need to, to keep you all very strictly to five minutes, and I do not feel I have the authority with this panel to do that. But I, at six minutes, I'm going to start coughing. Um, <laughs> Hugh, your time starts now. Not now. Give me a... <laughs> Um, well, it is an enormous pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming. I just would echo what we've heard before. Um, the common thread, actually, that Chris hasn't mentioned is, of course, that we are all UCL people, and UCL people are very, very different from any other university. Yeah, this university. Um, eccentric. Sounds going up and down, so if you can't hear, you need to shout. It didn't work very well. There we go. Quickly, any geneticists in the audience? Hands up. Right, you, can you leave now? <laughs> um, for those who don't know about it, human genome. Oh my word, human genome. That's not me humming. Shall I um, use a handheld? Thank you very much. I will thin this one and we'll start again. I'm down to three minutes now. I won't try and hide that one quite as effectively. Let's put up with it being a bit more. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So. <laughs> we're really good at tech here, right? We can. This is UCL. It is. A good. So this is the human genome. It's around 6 billion letters in around 3,000 genes. Whatever you want to define as together on a bunch of chromosomes. Inheritance uh, that makes up all humans. Basic shared code. But we are all very different. different. And it turns out that the small differences in the genes that we carry make very big differences to the way we are, what we would call a phenotype. So if you look at <laughs> lower primates and uh, a human, by and large, you can tell the difference between them, and it depends. This is a slightly can spurious. I do this? Sorry. Okay. Still okay. yeah. right. One more time. 
One more try. Does that work? Okay, good. We're there. <laughs> it's not my day, is it? I shall, I shall leave to Chris. So, um, obviously the genes presented go to Chris. So it's now on auto still. We'll go back. So we share roughly 96% of our genome with lower primates, and by and large we can tell the difference between uh, primates and our colleagues. Sometimes it's hard. Between individuals in this audience, if you choose someone who's unrelated to you, your genes differ, and that's 6 billion base pairs, by less than 1%. And yet if you look around this audience, you'll see that you're all very different indeed. And it's that combination of those small differences that makes you different from anyone who has ever lived before who, who will ever live again. Is it just the genes? No, it's clearly not. Um, you have a genetic propensity to respond in a slightly different way to any given environmental challenge, and it's the combination of those two interacting that make you the way you are. <laughs> so here's Chris. I, there were worse photos than this I could find, but here's Chris and Zand. Um, it turns out that if you look at the heritability of people who don't share essentially an identical genome, that even in extrovert personalities, I think you'd have to say Chris has got, around 50% of the variation across the population in that is down to the genes. And as I'd like to point out as well, uh, if you look up here, um, around 81% <laughs> of the variation in male pattern baldness um, is also heritable. The same applies to other characteristics like physical performance. So if you take a child and ask them to put their feet on the floor and jump, the height they'll reach, around 75% of that um, variation is genetic. If you look at how strong the bones are, how much muscle any of you in the audience as a teenager would have carried, your reaction times, strongly heritable, as indeed is your wish to participate, oddly, whether you choose to take the stairs rather than the lift or take a walk after meals, are strongly heritable traits. Here's the gene that we first worked on. It's known as the ACE gene, and I'm not going to give you a long lecture on it, except to say that... Um, if you've got, it comes in two flavours, a little bit extra, that's known as the I version, or a little bit missing, known as the D version. And because genes come in pairs, 25% of you in this audience have two I versions, half of you have an I and a D, and another 25% have two Ds. If we look over here, you will see that normal distribution. But let's look at elite runners. These are Olympic runners. Look at the number of IIs here in the sprinters. More again in the middle distance runners and a lot more in the long distance runners. And you'll see the opposites happening in the DDs here. A lot of them the sprinters, fewer here and fewer there because this gene strongly influences your ability uh, to perform sporting events. Such as this, one of my past um, hobbies, I suppose, climbing big hills. We put one of my research fellows down here at the Goutte Hut on Mont Blanc and when people went for the summit and came back, he just asked them one question, which was, did you get there? And we took a bit of gob for DNA, and there are the success rates. Outside bad weather, if you are an II, you will get to the top of Mont Blanc from the Goutte hut. And there's a 12 to 14% chance, if you're a DD like me, that you won't, which is my excuse for my poor mountaineering. <laughs> At UCL, we do try to translate this. So that was a hypoxic environment at high altitude. Um, Let's look at a patient on intensive care. Normal, nice, soft, moussey, soft, fluffy lungs. The Lowe's lungs can sometimes turn to what's more like liver. Very inflamed and no oxygen. And if we look at the patients with that syndrome, you find that just as the IIs have success in climbing, they have a very low mortality from this condition as well. This gene helps you use your oxygen more efficiently. And that's not just an advantage in climbing. It's an advantage if you become ill. And it makes a five-fold difference to your chance of surviving on an intensive care, which gets, that's going to be my legal defence uh, when one of my patients dies who shouldn't. <laughs> the advantage of the D allele, because I am a DD person, there must be an advantage, really, apart from obviously being hugely attractive. That's <laughs> um, it turns out that it's very good for sprinting. So again, if you look at um, the non-sprinters here, Look at the sprinters. Not many IIs, lots of IDs, and a lot more DDs. This was not just Russians, actually. These were Soviet athletes we looked at. And you find the same thing for another power sport, like swimming. So these are Commonwealth swimmers. Same again. Here are the other distance swimmers, the sprint swimmers, 
this huge advantage to the D allele. So if you want to run long distances, you want to be II or climb hills, you want to do power sports, you want to be DD. Just for fun, to show you that these things are heritable, it's a lovely set of studies from Germany and Austria that just looked at the names. If you were, of course, a hooper, you used to make barrels. If you were a smith, you used to hammer things. And if you were a tailor, you used to stitch cloth. And even to this date, if you look and ask people by the name of smith in Germany, they say they are much better at strength-related activities. And if you ask tailors, they tell you they're much better at dexterity-related ones. And in fact, the frequency of smiths goes up as you move from endurance to power sports in Austrian and German track and field athletes. So even now, you can see these genetic signatures over time. So to the last bit of my talk then, um, the future of using that sort of information. This is the average time for completing, uh, or the average speed rather, for completing the Tour de France. And what I want you to sh show you is that it has improved over time but it's not improving a lot. And the question really is, what's driven this improvement over time? Well, I've said it's genes and environment. The genes haven't changed. As far as we're aware, no one started monkeying. The technology has. So the environment has, from bikes like this in the early 1900s, through to these sorts of machines now with their titanium frames and carbon forks. So has hydration and nutrition. We've got better at understanding the human biology. So people used to stop for a quick sandwich break and a beer, and <laughs> that's a bit different over here. The big difference, actually, and if you factor it in, the biggest single factor has been nothing to do with those technologies. It's just been road surface. That's what they used to race on, and that's what they race on now. So most of that improvement has not been the, the genes, has not been the nutrition and the biology. It's just been a smooth road. Um, there are a few other things they don't do as well, like that. That's a great photograph, isn't it? <laughs> you know, why wouldn't you smoke a bit when you're doing the Tour de France, eh? <laughs> We've all done that. But things are changing. Now, I'm not going to point the finger at any individuals here, right? So for the sake of cameras and all the rest of it, I'm not going to name names, except when they're in the public domain. But let's look at the 100-metre world record time. It was following this curve right way through to the late 80s, and something's happened. Now, it ain't the genes. It could be nutrition. It could be psychology. It's unlikely to be better training shoes, but there's a something else going on. And to look at what goes on, let's look at how people are trying to emulate the genes they've got. So this is a Belgian blue cow. <laughs> this is a thing called a bully whippet, and this is a German child, actually, and you can tell at the age of four, has a rather unusual physique. <laughs> All of these have a mutation in a gene called myostatin that allows them to make a lot more muscle. Now, we haven't yet learned how to monkey with that gene, but we do know how to switch it on, and that's by using a bunch of drugs. So this individual here that you'll know is Ben Johnson in the Seoul Olympics. This is the drug he was using, st stanazolol, alol, which is essentially a, an androgen. It, it um, makes you grow a lot more muscle. You'll have read the papers as I've done. Drug use has influenced performance. This uh, individual has an unusual mutation in the gene for erythropoietin, the EPO gene. It means he makes a lot more red blood cells than you and I have got. In fact, probably twice as many red blood cells as some people in this room. Can't monkey with the gene, but you can take the EPO, which is what, and I will name the name, of course, because he's public, Lance Armstrong took, and a bunch of other people with him. There are other things going on. Uh, if you look in the 1990s, quite a lot of people in cycling went up at least one shoe size per season. Now, they're not children. That's because they're taking growth hormone. Um, if you look at the use of braces in athletes, they're going up because growth hormone makes the jaw continue to grow. So whilst you can't say that these people are definitely taking the drug, you can say that there are things happening that are consistent with that. Finally, then, if you can tinker with the genes with the drugs, what about tinkering with the genes? If this works, we're away. I want you to look at this. This is um, a genetic modification in a mouse, and you'll tell which one's been genetically modified. Mice like running on treadmills, and you can see this one is trying to keep up over here, and 
eventually you'll see he'll go, no, I'm still at it, I'm going to get back on there, and then we're now up to 0.2 kilometres, and now it's like, yeah, okay, I wasn't trying anyway, I'm not really, not really that fast. Okay. And the other one keeps going for hours, hours on the treadmill from one single gene variant they've done in this particular animal. So we're now two hours and still going. Um, this video goes on. The other mouse, as you can see, is just said, oh, come on, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this isn't fun. Now at three hours. So my last slide, which is just the question of whether we're going to end up doing this with humans. Um, the CRISPR-Cas story is there. You'll, some of you will have heard about this. It's the opportunity to edit human genes. And it's probably, to my mind the biggest and most exciting change that there has been in the treatment of patients. I think it offers the hope of cures where we've never seen them before. But I'll leave you with the thought that it does also leave you with the prospect of this being misused uh, to improve performance over time. And with that, I shall finish with a dreadful pun. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I told you I would have no authority here. Uh, Kate, you have 30 seconds to deliver your talk now. I'll try and be brief. The clock, assuming no AV mess-ups, the clock, your clock is there. OK, oh, thank you. Here. Is my mic working at the back? Oh, good, I don't need to hold it. Great. Um, good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello. Great, that's, what a lovely response. So one, one thing I was just going to say about UCL is it really is very supportive of new ideas and new disciplines. And in fact, the Jill Dando Institute for Crime Science is the first institute ever for crime science. And it shows that UCL are very, very um, proud to support multidisciplinary work that we hope has real-world um, impact. Because one of the one thing that we, things that we want to do as crime scientists is do real-world research which can really assist with preventing and reducing crime in practice. So it's really not an ivory tower. It's about trying to help make uh, the, the world a safer place. So just having a look at this slide, you might not be able to read the figures at the back. These are, these are years. Um, this shows the amount of crime, the estimated amount of crime in England and Wales from the late 1980s onwards. And what's really striking about this graph is that crime was on the increase until around about the turn of the century. And it's been... And it's been decreasing ever since. Can't you hear me? Oh. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. And it's been decreasing ever since. And actually, this trend has been a global trend. Um, sorry, it keeps uh, moving forward without, without me letting it do, do, do so. Um, so this is a global trend. And um, it's been seen in many different countries of the world. It's actually known as the international crime drop because it's been seen so, in so many different places. And so I suppose one of the questions that you ask looking at this graph is why? Why have we seen this global drop in, in crime? Well, there are many different plausible hypotheses for why we've seen this drop. But one that's actually supported by um, some evidence is, is known as the security hypothesis. And um, basically, the, the, the idea of the security hypothesis is that things have just improved, um, in part at least, because of physical improvements to security. Um, take cars as an example. It, it, despite soaring rates of vehicle theft in the, uh, in the 1990s, in, before the 1990s, the 80s and 90s, um, car manufacturers saw no real need to improve physical securities. And as a response to this, the Home Office released the Car Theft Index, which actually exposes the most risky models and makes of, of, of vehicle. And, and this naming and shaming of particular manufacturers paved the way for new policy, which meant that every new car that had been manufactured from 1995 onwards had to have an immobiliser fitted. In fact, the greater the number of security devices that your car has, the less at risk of theft that car is. And um, if you have a look at this chart here, we can see that if your, your car has got all three of these de uh, devices, a car alarm, an electronic mobiliser, and central locking, it's actually at 15 times less at risk of being stolen than a car that has got none of these different features. So there seems to be, there's this good news story, right, because we've seen these improvements to physical security, and the international crime drop seems to be a good news story. Unfortunately, the um, picture is more complicated than that. 
Um, and this is because crime recording systems aren't very good um, at actually um, taking into account new forms of crime. They aren't very good at recording or reflecting new types of crime. And actually, I was rather deceptive in the slide that I showed you first of all. The reason being that those, those, uh, the, the crime survey for England and Wales has only just begun to estimate levels of cybercrime. And in fact, these new um, experimental figures, which were quite literally from last year, show that uh, the estimated amount of cybercrime in this country was at 1.6 million crimes. And if I'd added those in to that graph, it would have roughly doubled the amount of crime that the nation saw in the last year. So, so cybercrime is really, truly on the rise. So what is the f- a future of uh, crime landscape? And, and what are the kinds of things that we might try and do to try and mitigate newly emerging crime problems? Well, of course, um, the answer to both of these questions lies in part with developing technologies. We know that the internet has allowed people to undertake existing types of crimes in new ways. I'm sure many of you read about the recent ransomware attacks, which brought down the administrative functioning of really large organisations, including the NHS. If you think about it, this is not so different from our car crime example, because in order for that crime to happen, somebody had had to manipulate a vulnerability in a physical system. And in order to try and address these problems, what we need is we need people who, can, who, who do have the competency to act against it to actually do so. We need people who can do it to, to get on with doing it for us. We live in really exciting times from a technological bu- viewpoint. And two great examples of this are the Internet of Things and smart cities. I'm sure you've heard about, about these two different ideas. And as this graph shows, you can see here on the left-hand side, um, the number of Internet-enabled devices that's currently in circulation is rising at the most dizzying speed. It really is rising um, at, at a phenomenal rate. Um, But what people don't really understand or don't think about is that unless you secure it, your your little innocent-looking toaster might actually be a crime enabler in a denial-of-service attack. It can, because what it might might end up doing is it might end up being part of a big distributed network which continually bombards a particular website until that disables the website's operation. So so we can see that that these kind of technological um, um, problems can happen. Uh, These new technological developments can actually have weaknesses too. And another great example is thinking about um, smarter cities and internet-enabled houses. Um, So these things are there to try and help help, um, everyday life smoothly flow. But the problem with it is that they, they also have crime implications or vulnerabilities. So take the example of you know, the new apps you can get that, that can um, have features which help you to do, to do things in your home remotely. You know, you know the kind of ap- applications I'm talking about. Well, if you think about it, if there's any crack in the armour of security of these things... Um, the issue with that is, is that you can, you know, an, an offender um, might be able to uh, conveniently open your front door and they might even use the sensor system that you've got to see whether there's uh, intruders to see if you're in before they proceed to burgle your home. So there's all these new opportunities of technology. So cybercrime is on the increase. Traditional property crime is declining. But what of violent crime? Violent crime is, has not seen so many dramatic increases as, as, um, as property crime. Um, police pri- t- priority is now with high harm crimes, such as uh, with high harm crimes, or um, <laughs> okay, okay. such as um, such as domestic abuse and hate crime. And these are really complicated crimes. They need multi-agency responses, but. Uh, te- um, developing technologies and new types of um, uh, policies can shape violent crime and they should also form part of the response to violent crime. So, I mean, the fact that hate crime increased following the uh, referendum is, was a foreseeable um, potential outcome. Um, if you think about certain changes to, crimi- to immigration policy, they might have implications for the degree to which um, it's people trafficking could, d- could go un- undetected. And we also know that the internet has been a new platform on which there's been a multitude of different ways in which offenders can both harass and exploit their victims. Um, and the, the take-home point from this is, 
is basically that with, with the uh, changes in policy, newly developing technologies, all have crime, crime consequences. Unfortunately, we're not, uh, uh, a consideration of these is not always top of the agenda. To, ha to, to, um, to support the criminal justice system, what we need to do as scientists is get as far upstream as we can of these emerging crime problems. Not only have we got to lobby innovators about the crime consequences of their current products and policies, but we also need to horizon scan for future developments and think, and think about um, how new science can both um, facilitate crime but also help us guard against it. In order to do that, what we need to do is keep up with the current cutting-edge research across many different disciplines. Unfortunately for me, UCL is one of the best places in which you can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Kate. I'm not getting better at this, am I? Uh, John, do you want to stay seated or do you want to... Uh, uh, so uh, the, your, your clock's there, and um, I'll ignore I'll, it like I'll everyone else says. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been asked to tell you about the future of the brain or the future of brain research, and uh, when I was asked to do this, I was immediately reminded of, of a saying by one of my uh, favorite idols, uh, the New York Yankee baseball player Yogi Berra, who said, "I'm really good at predictions, except when they're about the future." And I think that's the situation with most of our attempts to predict in, in, in science. It's really very, very difficult, and we're usually wrong. And when one goes back and sees the predictions people made even five years ago, they invariably are wrong. Having said that, we're, um, I will try to give you some flavor for, for where we think we're going in neuroscience. Um, we're actually in a revolutionary era. We're coming into a period which is going to be a period of explosion in our understanding of the brain. Um, over the last 50 years or so, we've gained an enormous amount of knowledge about the way individual nerve cells work, how a neuron works, how it takes its inputs from other cells, and it uses that to do simple computations. At the other end of the spectrum, um, we, we know from functional brain imaging and from lesions roughly which parts of the brain do which things. We know that this part of the brain back here has something to do with vision, this part has something to do with motor. The problem is that we believe that all the action is at the level between those two. It's at the level of neural circuits. It's at the level of which individual cells talk to each other in this extremely complex way where hundreds and thousands of cells cooperate to produce the ideas, the thoughts, the emotions, and, and, and the intentions that we have. And what's exciting now is we are just getting uh, the tools and the techniques to be able to start investigating things at that, at that level. And uh, until recently, I was the director of the Sainsbury Welcome Center at UCL here. So it's actually, the full name is the Sainsbury Welcome Center for the Study of Neural Circuits and Behavior. And this is a center which is actually dedicated to look at the brain in, at, at that level. So let me give you some idea of, of, of what this means. We now, up until recently, we could record from one cell or a few cells at the time. Now we have uh, new technologies which will enable us to record from thousands of these neurons at the same time. Some of these technologies are based on uh, silicone wafer technology. We've, we've actually brought uh, people who make computers into the field, and they're giving us technologies which enable us to electrically record from lots of cells at the same time. So we can look at the way in which they talk to each other. We also are taking advantage of, of uh, work that our physicist, physicist colleagues have, have uh, developed where we can use laser technology, optical technology, to actually look at the brain and see the cells and see how they're talking to each other. And both of those techniques will enable us to look at lots of cells and see how they interact. Probably equally or more important is we are now getting techniques which will enable us to actually address and change cellular activity. So in the past, neuroscience has been very much like astronomy. It's a passive science. You observe what's going on, you watch the animal's behavior, or you watch what the cells are doing, and then you try to make correlations and predictions. What we're now beginning to get available is a way in which we can actually impose patterns of activity on the cells themselves. So if you think 
that this group of cells, in my case it's a, a group of cells in the hippocampus, is actually representing the, I the idea of a location, the animal's idea of a place, then you can take that pattern and you can reimpose it on the animal's brain and ask, does the animal think it's in a particular place? And you can ask it a question which will, will give you that answer. So, what is this going to do for us in the future? Well, it's going to enable us to generate new theories and new ideas. Um, it's also going to be able to uh, 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 let us look at the problems that we now really have a, a difficult time looking at. For example, if you take something like schizophrenia, which we believe is, 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 is a disorder of, of disordered thought, we'll be able to look at the single cells. The problem is, from, from, uh, from uh, what, we, what we know now, is that the activity that represents a thought is represented by a pattern of activity. So it's not as though all the neighboring cells are doing the same thing. One, one cell might be doing one thing and the neighbor is doing something slightly different. So you have to look at all of the cells at, at the same time. Um, for example, another, another area which this is going to make a, a big difference is, is in, in the area of dementia. Um, UCL has a big, big uh, effort in, in, in the study of uh, dementia and the development of animal models of dementia. And of course, we believe that dementia is caused by changes at the molecular and cellular level, that there are toxic proteins. But in a sense, what we really want to do is see how those proteins are affecting the cells and the network of, of, of activity. And finally, um, we would think that, and this is probably a longer way off, that with these technologies and with these ideas, we'll begin to start to address some of the really difficult problems of brain research, which is, for example, what is the neural basis of consciousness? Right now, we really have very little idea about how large parts of the brain interact with each other to, to cooperate and to form some of the ideas and, and things like that. So we think that maybe we'll be, in the future, be able to address those, those ideas. And I, I, uh, I leave you with that thought. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Is this, is this now working? Is it work? Is that, am I working on that? Should Zoe use this? Zoe, okay. you're up next. I'm the up clock up. is there. Right. I'm going to come a little bit forwards. This is like the X Factor, isn't it? We've got four judges. <laughs> David Williams. <laughs> Amanda Holden. <laughs> Anton Deck. <laughs> Right, so, the Institute of Making. What we're interested in is the relationship between material and process. Basically, we are interested in the world around us and how we interact with it and it makes things and we make things in it. And the materials we use to do that. And if you think about it, that's kind of one of the, the things that sort of defines human activity. And we've named civilizations after it. We've got the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, the Silicon Age. The materials we manipulate and how far we push them and what we turn them into kind of defines us as humans. And at the moment, some people would say we're still in the Silicon Age. But actually, I'm going to propose that we're at the, we're at the, the doorway and the gateway to a new era where we really are at a fulcrum point between two things that used to be very disparate. Um, Chris uh, mentioned the periodic table at the start, and if you think about it, that's a kind of palette of ingredients. They are the known elements, and in combining them, we uh, have the world around us. But in some respects, it goes off in two directions, the animate and the inanimate. In the animate world, those elements combine to create plants and animals and that, you know, living things. And in the inanimate world, they combine to make like biros and chocolate and air. And that stuff, you know, they're, they're different. But I want to show you two things that speak about a future where the boundary is more blurred and extraordinary things are possible. But like all futures, we're sort of already there, but it's tucked away in the corner of research labs. Um, so the first thing I want to show you is this um, unextraordinary lump of stone which is actually too precious to let roll off that table. Um, this is a piece of self-healing concrete. Now, this concrete has bacteria inside it. They're impregnated in there, and they're dormant. In all intents and purposes, they're dead. But if they get wet, wake up, thankfully, 
in engineers have put some starch in there, a food that, that bacteria like to eat. So, you know, you wake up, hungry, little snack. You perk up a bit more, don't you? Eat a bit more. And then you start to excrete. And <laughs> the same is true of these, these bacteria. Now, this is happening at the scale of the bacteria. The, I can't snap this in half, dip it in some water, and it poo itself back together. This is about hairline cracks that form in the concrete due to the natural stresses and strains of existing, and moisture will get in. Then those bacteria will wait up, wake up, they'll eat the starch, then they excrete out a limestone-type material, which heals the cracks in the concrete. So now you have a concrete, which isn't this sort of just like... Well, concrete is the most abundant material on... Earth's surface. We have laid more concrete and put more concrete out there than anything else. And it just sits there and slowly degrades. But now it would be sitting there and be a living, responsive system that could make things last much longer, but also change how we respond to the types of things we might design and imagine. Because now we're imagining thing, things that will have to last a huge amount of time. They've actually discovered that um, the Romans inadvertently embedded the same bacteria in their concrete um, because they took the ash from volcanoes and built a coliseum. Well, that, that ash is where these bacteria hang around and then the Parthenon is actually... Oh no, not the Parthenon, that's in Greece. The coliseum <laughs> is actually uh, self-healing because of these bacteria. The other thing I want to show you, this is, a, this is something called a bioactive glass scaffold. So this is a piece of glass. Again, ancient stuff, right? We've been using glass for thousands of years and making things out of it, but this is sort of one of the cutting-edge points that glass technology has got to. This glass is designed to be implanted into the human body, and then once it's there, your body goes, oh, this, is, mm, this is good, I like, like, look at this, bone. And so it starts to grow new bone and deposit bone onto this structure, but not just that, it starts to eat this structure in order to grow more bone. So it's both a scaffolding for the growth and a food to provoke the growth of new bone. So the idea being if you were to have, maybe you've broken your wrist and you might have pins and splints and things, you could just cut it back to a nice clean end, insert a piece of this, plaster cast you up, and then your bone will grow back over a period of time, granted, but you won't have an implant anymore, you will just have yourself. So it's that idea of this is something completely inanimate, not alive, that's designed to become you and not be an implant anymore. But I think, again, just is on the cusp of helping you try to conceptualise and imagine a time when the world around us is living and responsive and growing, but yet still man-made. And ourselves, again, are thought of as made things that we can tweak and manipulate and extend you can see, I mean, the sex industry will take that on first, won't they? And <laughs> after that, we'll all be doing it. But this is being used now, albeit in small quantities. You can't grow your leg back yet, but you can do a couple of centimetres. And that's extraordinary for quality of life if you, have, uh, um, you need surgery on, or s bones that are fused in your hand or reconstructive surgery on your jaw, this sort of thing. Three, two, one. Thank you. <laughs> Wow. Wow. And I knew we'd get to the sex robots eventually. <laughs> I was brief to ask the first question, but I, I suspect actually there are going to be more penetrating questions, and, and, and you have all come here to ask questions. So unless... Uh, are there some questions from the audience? There are, quite a few. A lady in the leopard skin top at the back. This is a question for Zoe. Just shout and I'll repeat it. So the glass intervention, the glass scaffold, could it, could it be used for bioprostheses for hips or knees? Yeah, absolutely. At the moment, the problem is it, is it hasn't got the, the strength to be a load-bearing bone replacement at the moment. But we're talking something that's two or three years old of being put into people. And absolutely, I can see that's exactly where it's going. Do you see, Zoe, as we 
and this might be a, a question for John and Hugh as well. Do you see, as, as we get better at replacing our component parts, uh, various scientists are working on organ regeneration, is there going to become a moral or ethical dilemma with us being able to extend our lifespan in an unlimited way? Do you, do you concern yourself with that, or are you interested in the tech? Um, well, it, it is interesting to me that, for example, within biology, there are ethics committees, but within... The inanimate world, there aren't ethics committees. No one's going to stop you from making something if it's not living. But sometimes maybe those discussions should be had. And I think the, you know, the complexity of our future is you know, unarguable. And it's impossible to not want to have at the table early on multidisciplinary teams who know those things. So you want lawyers, you want ethicists, you want you know, historians to bring those discussions to life. Otherwise, you do get people... <coughs> doing something in a silo that maybe we should have a discussion about. So, yeah, it does, it does concern me and play on my mind. I think the notion of technological and engineering ethics committees I have not heard floated before, and that might be the most optimistic, futuristic prediction of the day. I love that. Um, any other questions from the audience? We've got, we've got masses. Uh, there are roving mics. Uh, I think the lady here in the Burgundy was, was, up, was up first. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, John and Keith. Uh, how far away are we from... So the, the, que the question was, in, in case anyone missed it, how far are we away from being able to read people's thoughts from having thought to police? So we started with Orwell, and you, you picked that up very nicely. John? Um, not as close as we would like to believe. Um, so um, using um, the current technology, um, fMRI, uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, we can uh, tell, for example, um, if a locked-in uh, syndrome person, a person who no longer has any, any uh, signs of uh, external signs of, 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 of life, but actually uh, where we suspect that they, uh, they might be conscious, we can actually tell whether they are thinking about, for example, being uh, in their mother's kitchen, which lights up the, the part of the brain I'm interested, the hippocampus, uh, and is a massive signal. Um, or whether they're uh, thinking about riding a bicycle, which lights up the motor cortex. And we can use that to actually ask them questions saying, well, if, if the answer to the question is yes, then you should uh, light up your hippocampus. If it's no, you should light up your bike. Um, the problem is, or, or you might think the, 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 the saving grace is, that um, for, as I sort of hinted at, for a lot of the processes that go on in the brain, um, that level is too gross. That level is, 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 is too gross to be able to uh, actually delve down into the, the actual thoughts. To, to get at the actual structure of thoughts and ideas, um, you need to go down to the single cell level. So you need to do what we can do with animals, which is to uh, record from lots of individual cells at the same time. You can't do that with, with human beings at the, at the present. Uh, on the other hand, one, one wouldn't want to rule out that new technological developments will enable us to do that non-invasively. Non so at the moment, I think it's not a worry, but I think we should be thinking about it. Thank you for the question about when it will uh, perhaps happen in 10, 20 years. Kate, what, what would thought police mean for you? Would that be good or would that be bad as a, as a crime scientist? Well, there's, a, there's an ethical dilemma. I mean, obviously, from the point of view, of it, we've all seen minority report on films like that where you've got this kind of idea of, oh, we can work out where offending, you know, what offenders are thinking or what they're going to do before they do it. Um, that's never going to be something that comes into crime policy. I mean, from the point of view of the way that we do predictions, is we use kind of things that are physical evidence in, in the world about the patterns in crime, and that's going to always be the way in which we, we look towards that. We, we could, you know, so from an ethical point of view, I don't think that uh, that's going to be a big one. <laughs> you're, not, you're not sticking electrodes into people's brains just I, yet? I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Have we got another question? The gentleman next to the, the, the previous question also had his hand up first. Do you want, do you want to just shout at me? Directed to really any of the panel that wish to answer. Um, I'm 75. How far is it the case that science, as my older view, is going to be able to facilitate the quality of my life and the length of my life? Can I can I can I kick that over to you to start with you? So the gentleman asking the question is 75, and he wants to know 
how much the science represented by the panel is going to influence both the quality and quantity of, uh, of life remaining. Hugh. Well, I don't know if this microphone's working yet or not. Is that, am I audible? Project. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll talk loudly if not. Okay, there is a microphone. Um, it's, it's interesting, if we look at average life expectancy in the Western world, average age to which people are living, it's getting longer. If you look at the maximum age to which people are living, it isn't changing at all. So biologically, we're pretty much programmed at the moment for a ceiling. So whilst public health interventions largely actually can improve um, the average life expectancy you might have, it's not pushing the boundaries yet of how long you'll live. That then brings two things. There is a very, very big industry going on in trying to work out what how to extend the human clock, actually. Um, I have anxieties about that for the reasons that were raised earlier. These people are sometimes blind when you speak to them to the societal implications of allowing people to live for 400 years because the planet can't support the number it's got, which means presumably you'd have to have an incredibly low birth rate and the world population would end up being lots of 102 and 3 and 400 year old people and small children would become an absolute rarity. Now what that means for society, I don't know, but it doesn't sound to me like a very good thing. The final bit of your question is... Anyone with small children might disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, given that you may be a father in the last hour, I don't know, Chris, and, um, given that Chris is expecting a father at the moment. Um, oh. Oh. Like literally any moment, so anyway. my phone is off. Um, the last bit is, is very pertinent, which is about the quality of life, because we do have to make sure that life is quality. And sad to say, a lot of my work on an intensive care units, I'm propping up people whose bodies are collapsing and their brains. And it's not a very edifying experience, and often it's, it's quite futile. But there's an awful lot of work to do to solve all of those problems, the degenerative diseases we get of mind, body, and brain. And the final blocker on those will be financial, because we can't support a health service we have at the moment. Um, am I pessimistic about that? No. It's, it's why the sort of work about which you've heard this morning is so important. Because if we can get those technologies right, you prevent those diseases happening, you readily solve them so that one lives out one's life um, to its natural end, in my view, but with dignity and comfort and functionality. And, and I like to think of that as the Duracell bunny model. I think we're all familiar with the Duracell bunny banging, you know, pink and fluffy banging the drum and then the batteries run out. Uh, that's my view of how I'd like to see life progress. I, I've been told no more questions, so I'm going to do one more. Um, <laughs> I, a lady over there was very enthusiastic uh, in, in the, bla the black top. Um, m make it short and, and a really good okay. one. So, <laughs> no pressure. Very, very short, but kind of tricky, two questions. It's great about the bacteria pooing, fixing stuff, but how would that could interact with humans? Because I'm sure there would be no ethical issues with regenerating um, the concrete. The other thing is, and possibly maybe before Professor O'Keefe, um, do we, are we forgetting about neuroscience in regards to possible exposure um, uh, exposure problems like for example traumatic brain injury seems to be a huge problem at the moment and is, it comes in certain areas through occupational exposure for example in football and um, also in the military might be uh, seen as occupational exposure because of the training they're going through are we forgetting about those things and just focusing maybe too much on disease okay Zoe quickly ethical implications of having bugs in our buildings are there any are you worried do you mean like the, the, the bugs, the ethics of a bacteria? Or do you mean th it might harm us? Is, is there Our an infectious risk? <coughs> yeah. Well, not with them as they are. I, I could almost feel that. That might be the yeah, one question on, I could that. feel. Go on. I don't think so. And we'd be pretty able, actually, to make detailed predictions about that, which I won't. John, <laughs> your, your, uh, the question was about um, yeah, traumatic brain injury, which actually UCL is a, is a, is a world centre of, um, uh, but John, you may be able to... Yes, to and, and, and of course, as we try to develop techniques to cope with um, the, uh, the injuries that we inflict on ourselves and others, um, we should keep in mind that perhaps a better way of going about it uh, is just to not inflict those injuries in the, in the first place. Uh, uh, you've all been an absolutely amazing audience. I want to get a selfie with all of you before we go. <laughs> Come on, it's 2017. We get used to this. Can the, can the panel all twist around in your seats? And can everyone...
Everyone just wave at me and, and, and give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Right.